application performance is important. Just because your application works in development does not mean it will work well once hundreds of people start using it. One key area to look at is data access. Talking to your database can be expensive, especially when the data might not change that often. That's where caching comes in. We can cache that data in a number of ways so we do not need to keep going back to the database for it. In this video, we're going to look at one of the simplest caching mechanisms in .NET called in-memory caching. We will create an application without caching, observe the performance, and then see how, to, how caching can improve our performance. We'll also discuss the best practices when using in-memory caching. Now, if this is the first video you watched of mine, my name is Tim Corey, and it's my goal to make learning C-sharp easier. I provide videos here twice a week on YouTube to help you grow as a developer. I also have a full set of training courses on I am Tim Corey and a podcast titled Dev Questions. I encourage you to check out all the resources that I have to offer. Now, this video, as with most of my videos, is gonna create some source code. If you'd like a copy of the source code, use the link in the description. So let's go over to Visual Studio and we're gonna create a new project. Now this most easily works with web projects because they already have built-in dependency injection. We're gonna go ahead and use that. In fact, we're gonna create a Blazor server application. Let's call this caching example and caching example uh, app. And we'll hit next. And we're gonna use .NET 6. We're not gonna use authentication. We are gonna use HTTPS. We're not going to enable Docker. Hit create. And this is just our standard application. We're gonna start ripping as right away, but first let's create a new class library. So right click on the solution and say, add new project. We're gonna create a class library, hit next. And we'll call this our data access library and .NET 6. I'm gonna create a class library here. Let's delete class one. I create a class library because of the fact that I do want to show off how it worked differently, a little differently, inside a class library as opposed to just inside Blazor itself. So we're going to create a new class. And this is a very much a demo app, so we're not going to go through all the, the normal procedures of folders and all the rest. We'll just create everything right in the root. It's fine. This is demo. So let's create employee class, employee model. And we'll make it public. We're going to say prop string first name, prop string last name. So all that's doing is creating a first and last name, really simple model for us to work with. And the idea here is this is going to hold an employee's information. Again, there's a lot more to employee than just a first and last name, but that's all we need to worry about with this demo. Next up, let's create a class. So we'll say add class, and we'll call this our sample data access. This is going to, let's make it public. This is going to simulate the idea of us talking to a database. We're not gonna to talk to a database because that's not the point of this video. So let's create a public list of employee model. And nope. IntelliCode got ahead of us there, and we're going to say get employees. So we're going to create a list of employee model, and we're going to call this output, and we'll say equals new. That creates a new instance of it, and finally we'll return output. Now in between here, let's actually put some sample data in place. So output.add new. IntelliCode wants me to put the new employee model, but with the, the new syntax, I can just say new like this, make it shorter. And it's already long enough, so I'm gonna make it shorter like this. That way it's just, it doesn't go off the edge of my screen. I'll create a couple more of these. And Sue and Jane and Storm, and let's go with Jones. Okay, 
So now we have us get employees, it returns three employees. But we want to simulate the idea that it's expensive. Now, in a real data access scenario, maybe you're accessing a thousand records or 10,000 records, something larger, where, or maybe it's across the network, talking about an API, whatever it's gonna be, you'll probably have some sort of delay. Now, for us, what I'm gonna do is I'm going to simulate a delay of three seconds just to show off the fact that it's it's operating slowly. Now, obviously, if your data access takes three seconds, you might want to address that in some way. But for our demo, we're just gonna say thread.sleep and we'll sleep for 3000 milliseconds. So that's going to delay the output returning for three full seconds. And that's pretty much our entire demo code to start with. So we have us get employees, it's gonna return a list of employees. And then from there, we're going to uh, get those employees over on the other side. So for that, we need to, first of all, right click on dependencies for our caching example, say add project reference, reference our library. References go one way, so you cannot reference your caching example down your data access library. Don't do that. It's only one direction. And then down here in program.cs, what we're going to do is we're going to add, add a reference to that. So we're going to say builder.services. Add transient. And we're going to say sample data access. Control dot to add that using statement like so. Now I didn't create an interface for this. Normally I would with my uh, data access, I'm sorry, dependency injection, but um, I'm not going to for this. Again, we're trying to keep it simple. So with our data access now added, we can go and talk to that on a page. Let's go to pages, let's go to fetch data page. So if we were to run this application, the fetch data page is the weather page. In fact, it says here weather forecast, that's the page title. Let's call this employee directory. And we'll call the same, use the same thing for the H1 tag here, employee directory. Let's get rid of the injections here. Um, let's get rid of everything, basically all the sample code right down here, get rid of it all and even get rid of this. So we're starting over on the employee directory. The only thing we're keeping is basically the page, which is fetch data. And I changed these two things. This by the way is a new feature. And what it does is it changes the, um, the title in your tab of your browser. Really cool thing. So it's actually talking to the title in the header of your individual page. So now with our code, we want to say, oops, let's add a import statement first. Go to imports. And we're going to say at using and our data access library. What, what that will do is it allows us to not have to add a using statement here in order to say something like list of employee model employees. Okay. So you have to add a using for our data access library. Now that we're here, Let's go ahead and say protected override on initialized. We don't need async because you're not making an async call. Now what on initialized does is it calls every time the page is loaded, it, this gets called. And so you can say, Hey, give me some data. So in this case, we're going to say employees equals data, which we don't have yet. Let's grab data. So up here, we're going to say inject and sample data access. We'll call it data. So employees equals data dot get employees. All right. So what we do here? Well, we injected this from dependency injection. We gave it a name of data. We're now calling that in our on initialize async. We're getting those employees. We're putting them into the employees object, which is right here. Now up in our code, we're going to say at if employees is not null, then we're going to do a for each and we'll say var e in employees. 
And then inside here, let's just create H3 records. That's fine. Just for the demo. E dash first name space at E dash last name. Now we're using the, the at symbol here um, because we're mixing both HTML and C sharp code. So whenever we're mixing, we have to then, we've gone to HTML here, therefore we have to say, okay, now it's time for C sharp code. In that space, we have to go back to calling the ad again because it's again thinking it's HTML. So that's the difference. Um, I don't think we need one of the for each here because of the fact that it's right inside the if statement. If we do, we'll just throw it on. So let's see this work. This should be all we need to get our application up and running. Let's see if it actually loads. It's always a good first sign. There we go. And the page is loaded. We can go to the counter. The counter works. Let's go to fetch data. Wait for it. Wait for it. Wait for it. There we go. So fetch data works, but it's slow. We go to home, boom, right there. Counter right there. I just clicked and I'm waiting, waiting, wait, there we go. Now the page loads. Not a great experience, but there are things we can do to get better, right? We could probably make this an asynchronous call. Right now it's a synchronous call. Cool. Let's go ahead and do that. So let's go over to our sample data access and we'll say, okay, this is all synchronous. Let's make it asynchronous. In fact, let's, let's copy this so that you have an example of each. So public list of employee model, call it get employees async. And we should make this an async task of type employee model. And we'll do the same thing we're doing here. Only we're going to say, instead of thread.sleep, we're going to say await task.delay. It's a similar process, but it's actually making it, it's an asynchronous await. I'm sorry, it's an asynchronous call that's awaiting. So therefore you can await on this. It's going to stop doing work here but it will continue to allow the UI thread to interact. So we now have an asynchronous call. We can come back over to our um, employees page. Let's comment this out. And we're gonna say protected override on initialized async. We can get rid of the starter code here and we can say async Ask, and we'll say employees equals await data dot get employees async. So now we made it asynchronous. Cool. That shouldn't lock up the UI. So let's run this again. And we'll see if this makes a difference in how our page loads. So counter fetch data. Oh, the page loaded. It says employee directory but then it waited to show, have this show up, okay? So we can make a slight improvement here where we have, if employees is not null, we can say else and have an H2 that says loading. Actually, it should be um, probably an H3 because we're, both of these are H3s. So let's run this again. And now once we go to that page, it should say, hey, you're loading, you're not done there. There you go, we're loading, loading, loading. There we go, now there's our records. So it's still taking just as long to get the data, but at least it's showing us a loading bar. But that's an expensive call. And imagine if we wanted to show the employee directory quite often. You don't want people to wait around for the employees if you can help it. and Hopefully your employee directory isn't changing every minute. So if this was showing up on every page or this was a common thing, maybe you're calling it, you know, once, twice, three times a minute uh, per person, that would be very, very expensive. Well, there's other ways to do this. And one of the ways we're gonna look at is in memory caching. So this employee list does not change that often. Therefore, we can say, hey, let's cache this 
so that we don't have to always uh, load it from the from the database, we can pull it from our own memory. To do that, let's start by going to program.cs in our Blazor project. Down here in the services section, we can say builder.services.add memory cache. Okay, it's already built in, add memory cache, all we have to do there. And what this will do is it's gonna add caching for us. And this is gonna create a singleton for us so that we can call this across all of our, uh, our different instances, which means that you don't wanna put stuff in here that you allow anybody to have access to if they're not allowed to. So for instance, if I were to cache um, a person's social security number, I wouldn't wanna have anybody else get access to that. So I'd still wanna protect it in the same way I protect the data access call for that person's social security number. But for shared things, especially for things like um, the list of employees, that's we can share that across callers, which means that we can cache that data once and then have everyone use it. So let's go back to our, um, our sample data access. We're gonna create a new method. So now you have a sample of each. Public async task list of employee model, like so, get employees, uh, let's say call it cached or cache because this will return the cached employees asynchronously. This is just a name to tell us the difference between the three of these. It's not necessarily a trend I would use or a, a key. I, I'm not saying this is, this is like async. You don't have to tag your methods as cache capable. Okay, just be clear there. So we're gonna create something very similar here. So we'll create a list of employee model called output. I'm not going to instantiate yet though. And I will return output, which will break right now because it's returning a, uh, a non-instance, a null. But what I'm gonna do is I want to grab the cached version of this list. To do that, I need to be able to talk to the cache. So I'll create a constructor and I'm gonna say, in the constructor, I'm gonna ask dependency injection for an I memory, which I can't get access to yet. Whoops. I've got to add one more thing. And that is, and this is why I did a class library here over in our program.cs. No problem. Add, um, add memory cache. It knows where that is. Cool. But over in our class library, whoops, over here, it doesn't know about memory cache. So we have to add that ourselves. So right click and say, manage to get packages. And we're gonna say microsoft.extensions.caching.memory. So if it does not exist in your particular uh, project type, just go ahead and add it. This is a NuGet package. It's from Microsoft. Hit install and okay. Once it's installed, now we can say I memory cache like so. And then we have to do a control dot to add the missing using statement for Microsoft.extensions.caching.memory. Once we do that, we can say uh, memory cache. Now I'm gonna do a control dot here and create and assign a field like so. Now yours may not do the same thing. It might say this memory cache equals memory cache and not have the underscore here. If you, I've got an upcoming, um, 10 minute training on how to change this to use this format. But if you want this format, then just copy it manually until you watch that 10 minute training. Okay, um, this is just a shortcut. It's all it's doing to assign this to a private read only version called underscore memory cache. So now down here, I can start working on my output. I can say output equals, whoops, memory cache dot get. And I want to have a list of employee model like so. And I want to pass in a key. Now the key is something that this is a key value pair. So therefore you have to remember the name of the key. 
I'm gonna call this uh, employees. I could uh, create a, a variable that holds this. That's fine. That's probably what I do in a real application. But for this, this works. So it's gonna find the employees in the cache. Now you're saying, but but how, Tim? Because there is nothing cached yet. You're right, there is nothing cached, which means we're gonna have an if, we're gonna say output is null. So if output's null, then we don't have any data from the cache. Therefore, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna grab from here, notice I'm grabbing the output equals new. We're gonna grab all the way down to here including the task.delay. Okay, so now I have instantiated the output, I have added the three items, and I have delayed just like the above async. That way we're not comparing apples to oranges. This is an apples to apples comparison if we create the new entry. But there's one last important step here if you do not find it in the cache. And that is, if you wanna find it in the cache ever, you're gonna wanna say memory cache dot set employees output. Now it could be done here, but I do not want to be. This is important. At the very end, you need to give it a time span. I'm gonna say from minutes one. What this does, let me unpin this so you can see the whole thing. What this does is it says, okay, I want you to take that output I just created, which took those three seconds. I want you to put that into the cache named employees, but I only want this cache to live for one minute. This is important because in memory caching, is something you have to be careful about. This is one of those, um, Tim's gonna make sure that you're clear on this sections. So memory caching is not limited. Now, where is it storing it? The clue is in the name, memory. So if you put too much data in your memory cache, you will run out of memory. That would be a problem. Now, memory caching does not have a idea of limiting based upon the number of kilobytes in your memory or things like that. You can limit the number of things in your memory, but it's more about limiting the number of objects or saying this many whatevers in my memory. And you get to choose those numbers. It's not a, a, um, a size as far as kilobytes, megabytes, and so on. So it's a little more delicate and you do have to be careful the the caching can be used to a higher degree. For example, you can say what the priority of this cache is compared to other things. That way, if the system starts running out of memory, it will take away the older things and the lower priority things and the things that are expired before it takes away your high priority thing. But I don't find that terribly useful because I don't intend to ever use memory caching that heavily. Instead, I want to use memory caching for things that I know aren't going to be too strenuous in the memory and that will actually make my memory lighter because I'm not continually calling for those new records and creating new instances of the data. For instance, let's just pretend that this output list here is 100 objects long. Well, if I'm call, if every person calls this every time I load the application, that's creating a hundred new objects every time any person creates these objects. Instead, I'm taking the hundred objects, storing them once in memory, and then having everybody talk to them, everybody see them. Therefore, it's more efficient as opposed to what I was doing. So you can definitely take advantage of it that way, but don't just say, hey, I might need these you know, million records. I'm going to throw some cash just in case I need 10 of those. Well, that's going to affect your memory negatively. So don't do that. But the other thing is that you don't want to have things in your mem your cache indefinitely because of the fact they may get old. For instance, yes, employees do leave. New employees do come. How, how often do you want, how old do you want this data to be? So for an employee list, you know what? Really? it could last a full day.
not a problem because that list isn't changing. So yeah, not a problem to last a full day. For our case, we're just going to say a minute. And, and a lot of times you want a cache that lasts a short period of time like that. Maybe, you know, if the person's bouncing back and forth, they're going to see this list a hundred times, but it's going to be a hundred times in 10 minutes. Well, then maybe you cache it for the 10 minute period and they only ever load the list once. So be careful how much data you put in the cache and be careful how long you let it sit there. What this will do is after a minute's time, it's going to tell a system, yeah, you can get rid of me. Which is another important point here is you have to, you have to count on the data not being there. You have to prepare for it not to be there. This is why I don't just say, hey, get the cached values and return. I say, hey, get the cached values, but if it's null, Let's go ahead and go to the database, get the real values, and then cache those values for the next call. All right. So I'm trying to be very clear here. Use caching appropriately. Do not abuse it. Otherwise, you're abusing your own server and making your life worse, not better. There's a balancing act to hit here. There is not one clear cut. Well, this is better than the other in caching, just like most other things in development. It does depend on your circumstances. Just being clear though, you need to be careful. Okay, so with this caching in place, now we're gonna talk to the cache. The first time it'll be empty. Therefore, we'll do the same thing essentially as what we're doing up here. But the last step is here is we're gonna save that to cache. Next time, we're gonna find it in cache. It's not gonna be null, therefore we're gonna just go ahead and return. Let's see this in action by going back to our, um, oops, our fetch data page. And instead of get employees async, we're going to get employees cache. It's still asynchronous, but this is going to talk to the cache. Let's run this application, make sure it runs. We haven't missed something. Wait for it. There we go. So counter still works, home still works. Let's go to fetch data. It's loading and it's done. Okay, let's go to counter, back to fetch data. It's already done. Okay, you see the difference there? I can go back and forth all I want and that page is done. I have to wait for it again. Now, if I wait a full minute, then it's going to go back to the cache again and say, oh, you know what? You're you're no longer there, therefore I have to go back to the quote unquote database and get the data. Let's just see if we can't wait for that to happen. Once it does click over, I haven't, I haven't been tracking how long it is, but once it does click over, it's gonna go back to that idea of loading before it you know, shows us our data. So not exactly a, a huge mind blowing thing, but I did wanna show you that in fact it does happen. Um, Wait for it, wait for it. Oh, by the way, if I go to a new instance, let me pull up a new in private instance. Um, let me just make sure it's, the cache is still here. Oh, there it goes, it's loading again. There we go. So now let's grab this URL. Let's go to our, our new in private mode and we'll paste and go. It loads right there. There's no delay on that. Because the fact that it cached once is a singleton which means that any other caller still has access to that cache. Again, we wouldn't want to cache sensitive data in the, um, in the instance where everyone can have access to that same instance. But if we, let's say, limit it by employee ID and only allowed an employee to grab their own employee IDs worth of stuff, then that could work. But just be careful of caching sensitive data. I tend to avoid it whenever possible. But instead, things like this that are essentially viewed, things that everyone has access to, maybe another thing is, for whatever reason, you have the months of the year in your database. Now, you don't need to, but let's just say you did. Well, then you could cache that data in a really long time span because that's just something that everybody is going to see and at the same time is not going to change 
ever, hopefully. Um, so with that, then you can use cash to make your, your application much, much faster. Now, to be clear, when I shut this down and I load it back up, that cache is gone because it's an in-memory cache. This is simulating what happens if you restart your web server. So if I restart a web server, this list is no longer in memory because it's an in-memory cache. Therefore, you have to load all your things up again, which means if you're doing a lot of caching on things that come from a database, but maybe aren't, um, aren't updated a lot, like your employee directory and like a, uh, a few dropdown lists that come from a database, but, um, you know, the same all the time. So you cache those. Your initial performance, your application is being a little bit slower because of the fact it's talking to the database the first time for all of those things. Where you might want to load your application up once after you deploy it to be, you'd be the one that loads all those caches. Once they're cached, then the next visitors have an instantaneous response like I'm seeing here. Okay, so that's caching. That's how it works. It's really not hard. It's the idea that you just say get and set. The key thing here is set is make sure that you have a time span here that is appropriate for the element you're storing. Now you can use, instead of the time span here, you can use cache options and have a lot more granularity. There's things like a sliding scale. So you can say, hey, if no one accesses this cache for five minutes, then go ahead and refresh it. But there's also an absolute time and you want to set both if you set one. So if you set the sliding scale, then go ahead and set the absolute as well. The absolute is, it doesn't matter if you've all been accessing this cache continually after an hour, this cache is invalid and refresh it. So there's options like that. And there's others you can look at as well. But again, I don't get that deep into memory caching because if I'm being that precise and that um, in depth on my caching, I'm going to go to another step up, like let's say Redis, where I've covered that before. Redis is a great caching mechanism for uh, making your, your database load lighter, making your application faster, and at the same time, not overburdening your memory with in-memory caching. So this is, there's different levels here. I would say if you're going to do simple things, the in-memory caching is the way to go. It's fast, it's powerful. And if you don't abuse it, it's great. If you start abusing it, yes, like anything else, it's going to make your life miserable, but really it should because you're abusing the thing. So with that, that's memory caching. Check it out. Try it in a web application. See how it works. It does work in desktop applications and other. You just have to do a little bit more work in order to either my recommendation is get it in a dependency injection. So you have to get a little bit more work in order to get this going. Um, but once you do, then you're, you're golden. You can use it just like you would in a web application, but in a desktop application. So with that, let me know down in the comments if you have any questions or thoughts. I'll try and get to as many as possible. I obviously can't respond to every comment, but I do try at least look through them and see if there's any questions I need to answer on a future video or if I can answer something really quickly. All right. Thanks for watching. And as always, I am Tim Corey.